Hi, my name is Scott the Miniature Maniac, and in this video, we're going over all my favorite paints to use for miniature painting. What up, Mini Family? I was recently inspired by a Ninjan video wherein he goes over his favorite paints and figured why not give it a shot myself. You can find his video linked down in the description for more hobby goodness. Hey, I smell, I smell a thief, a thief in the night. My grandpappy once told me, you don't steal another man's peanut butter sandwich. Tuna sandwich, that's fine. But this here, this is my peanut butter. Quick reminder to my fellow content creators that when you are inspired by another creator's videos, mention them in your video to share the love. Let's begin with typical acrylic paints that I have specific uses for. Because I've had Scale 75 paints as my daily driver paint range for over five years at this point, quite a few colors are from that range. Brown leather is the right brown color for me. It's the perfect mixture of darkness and warmth, along with all the other positives of the Scale 75 brand. It's one of only two paints that I've had to replace from the range because I've used all of it. If I ever need a color for a pouch, a belt, boot, poop, mm -hmm. I suppose, this is my go-to. I mix random paints that are already on my palette with brown leather to get a variety if I'm painting a model that needs a couple of brown leather details. The only downside, if you want to call it that, is its finish. It's actually the downside of all Scale 75 paints and matte paints in general. The mini painting world views matte paints as an entirely positive thing, but it's neither negative or positive. It's just a feature of the paint, and satin paints have just as much value in my collection as matte paints. I would also love a satin version of this exact hue to use as a companion. Similar to brown leather, there's bearing blue, which is just the right amount of desaturation and also brightness. This color can do it all. <laughs> I sound like a late night TV salesman. This blue can do it all. It can do blue, it can do red, it can do your mama. <laughs> on a more serious note, it can be a fun shadow for white, a mid-tone all on its own, a highlight for black, and likely more. I would also love a satin version of this exact paint. As far as I'm concerned, the first and last red paint you'll ever need is Chimera's The Red, if you aren't afraid of mixing. Okay, one color. Oh, <laughs> I can't do it, no, I can't do it. Chimera is a slightly innovative brand in that they give you pigment information on the bottle, and the majority of their range is single pigment paints, like a lot of tube paints you'd find at an art store. Unlike artist grade tube paint, however, they come in a format many painters are familiar with via dropper bottles, and instead of hard body paint, a soft body, like mine. <laughs> because of their single pigment composition, they mix like a dream, while also being incredibly matte and incredibly saturated. Heck, even the coverage isn't too shabby either. The red is the perfect starting point. You can desaturate it, you can make it glossier, make it thinner, do whatever you want. Note that not all Chimera paints are this good. The range is a bit inconsistent. I planned a bit where I was gonna spit this paint pot out of my mouth because I guess that's funny. <coughs> oh, I can't manage it. <laughs> How's that for a segue? Continuing on our Scale 75 fanboy train, Thar Brown, which is really more of a cream color, is a great place to start for the whites of your miniature's eyes. After literal years of messing around with mixtures and other paint that were way too bright, I finally settled on a color that reads as a real eye white color, but also allows brightness headroom to see a specular highlight. I often mix a smidge of whatever my skin tone is into Thar Brown for added realism. All right, let's take a break from my favorite paints to introduce this week's sponsor. Eightfold Paper is showing off their new fifth edition battle book, a concept that is kind of new to me for Dungeons and Dragons. When it comes to role playing and video games, I have the attention span of a toddler, which is why I've always struggled to get into role playing. But with Riftborn, Champions of the Multiverse, I could genuinely see myself getting into tabletop games like D&D more. In Riftborn, your players will experience near death, multi-wave boss battles, all while keeping the combat easy to follow for your GM. Each instance has multiple unique monster minis to represent each boss, like a creepy spider queen or, of course, a vampire. I give this book 10 out of 10 because <laughs> each unique monster twists on established tropes and archetypes has its own exclusive hand-drawn layer. Take on Giga Mimic, the protein overlord, if any of your party is chat enough for the task. Each combat is balanced for parties at low, 
medium, and high levels and uses our primal form mechanic to keep your players engaged and thrilled. Going primal, a boss evolves and becomes stronger, employing new tactics and forcing your players to adjust their game plan. Not just that, each boss's exclusive battle map matures throughout the encounter with turmoil and destruction. I love the idea of getting straight into the role-playing action with an engaging and evolving boss fight. A lot of D&D is crafting a story through your interactions with the world, but sometimes I just want to slap somebody around. If you're like me, this book seems like the perfect supplement. You can find links to the Kickstarter campaign in the description below. Thank you to 8 Fold Paper for sponsoring this segment of today's video. Now on to the greens. As a wood elf enthusiast, did you really think I wasn't gonna have a whole section dedicated to green? For shame. While not necessarily a triad, I very often use these three green colors together as a shadow, mid-tone, and highlight while painting a subject that has some amount of green on it. I'm not the biggest fan of a typical grass green color, so this is a fun deviation. Additionally, I often use these colors separately in other ways. Field gray can be a greenish shadow for white, Arden green can be a green highlight for black, so on and so forth. Time for everyone's most terrifying category, the white. Ooh. If you want a white paint that's for mixing, Yosonia's titanium white is prime time. I don't paint a lot of minis that are purely white, so I'm not sure what kind of mileage you'd get out of this paint as a base coat or something like white scars, for instance. But that being said, if you ever were to paint something that was supposed to end up looking white, I'd personally never base coat the model with white in the first place anyways. I don't know how different Yosonia is compared to other artist acrylic brands. I just know that I've had this tube paint for years and it's been serving me greatly as a paint to mix highlights with or as my final highlight on white or reflective subjects like NMM or Silk, for instance. As far as using white through an airbrush goes, I'm still a fan of any kind of high flow acrylic ink. Apply highlights, then apply undercoats, it works great. I've been playing around with Tamiya White as a replacement based on a recommendation from Cult of Paint and their channel here on YouTube, but white acrylic ink still does a perfectly good job and it's also water soluble. So I can do things like mix it with my Yosonia Titanium White to get a great white edge highlight color. It's the perfect mixture of both flow and also coverage. It only seems right that if we talk about white paints, we also gotta talk about black paints. It's a good idea to have a mixture of both satin and matte blacks, and you don't gotta be too precious about the brand. For a black that's right down the proverbial finish middle, Vallejo model color is great. Not too satin, not too glossy. On the glossier side, Citadel, Foundry, and Vallejo game color are all great options. Just like with white paint, I often mix a high flow black acrylic ink into my blacks to create an awesome recess shade paint. Sometimes I even use black ink as a glaze for black shadows. The glossiness of the ink helps to deepen the black color, which is often the hardest part of dealing with black paint. It has a tendency to become too gray while highlighting. A paint that's more matte is perceivably too light of a starting point. It can definitely work, it's just a lot harder. While we're in the world of whites and blacks, let's talk about paints that I often use for highlighting and shading on my miniatures. When it comes to mixing highlights, I'm kind of a basic bitch. I like Vallejo's Ice Yellow for that perfect mixture of bright enough and not too yellow. If you want an autopilot color to mix highlights with, this is a pretty great choice. Do you know what's also a great choice? Checking out miniac.co for this sexy hoodie. In the world of highlighting, I'm also a big fan of using Caribbean Blue for highlighting purple. I don't really like the look of a warm purple color, so I often avoid that hue altogether. And to push it even further into the cold arena, Caribbean Blue helps a lot while creating an interesting look. With some yang, you need some yin. Onto the shadows. Not sure why I didn't use that segue when talking about actual white and black paint, but uh. Earlier I mentioned two bottles of paint that I had to replace from the scale 75 range due to me using the paint in its entirety. The other is deep blue. This color is the perfect mixture of saturation and darkness for a shadow color. Very often I'm shading green and brown with it, but you could do a whole lot more. If you need something less saturated, I often reach for Abyssal Blue, which I use fairly often when shading true metallic metals. For the world's greatest purple color, look no further than Violet from Chimera. This is the darkest, inkiest purple known to mankind. Look what happens when I mix white, a color that should desaturate it. My God! I often use this to glaze in shadows because it's so dark and saturated. It can be challenging to get a shadow that's both colorful and dark, but this accomplishes that with ease. Despite me mixing the absolute hell out of it, <laughs> oh! 
Okay. It's still fairly satin compared to the rest of the range. That isn't necessarily a downside, just something to be aware of. Time for everyone's second most terrifying category. Skin dude. <laughs> for a marginally unique hue, I really like sandalwood from Scale 75, which I believe is supposed to be mimicking a species of wood. It lacks the typical orange tinge you see in most skin tones, but I kind of like it for that reason. I often use it to mix a vampiric skin tone with blue, like abyssal blue or deep blue, and I get a pretty interesting effect. Because it lacks that orange, my mid-tone doesn't become too gray and nasty. It still reads as a skin tone while also looking pretty dead. For something more normal, I often use Talarn Flesh, an old foundation paint from GW, and Caucasian Skin from Chimera. These paints are the right level of warmth for a Caucasian skin tone, which is what I'm painting most often because I, myself, am a skinny white boy. If you haven't been already blinded by the light. What's the next part? Revved up like a douche? Does he actually douche? These are fairly similar in hue, but one is matte and the other is satin, so they're useful for me at different times. When I want to try hard, I use the matte stuff. When I'm planning on using washes later down the road, I reach for the satin stuff. Speaking of washes, Nowadays, I kind of find myself using washes less and less because I'm not a baby. <laughs> you kidding me? Who uses just washes? <laughs> what? The ones I've used the most often in the last year or so often are fun colors. Dracken off Nightshade and Quelia Green Shade from Citadel are both great. I use them when washing my Greyjoy models for A Song of Ice and Fire. It gives the entire model a very unifying cold green feel. For a generic matte brown wash, I prefer to use Iron Painter's Quick Shade. I'll often use this while speed painting a generic character like in this video. When I'm phoning it in for TMM, I very often use glossy washes from Citadel. I find that these maintain the luster of metallic paints really well while lending some definition to them. Or something super simple, base coat in your favorite silver, wash and known oil. Job's done. Yes, me lord. I'll figure it in. Be careful to not ace other parts of the model with this stuff because that glossiness really shows up where it's not supposed to. Speaking of metallics, when it comes to gold, I really enjoy Scale 75's Metal and Alchemy range. Necro Gold is just the perfect desaturated TMM gold paint. If you're looking to deviate from that traditional rich gold color you see in every single GW box art, this is a pretty great set to have. I often use Peridot Alchemy to highlight and Citrine Alchemy as a final highlight for gold and copper. Please, I beg of you, stop using so much silver paint to hide your gold. Silver and gold and silver. Is it too early for Christmas songs? My wife would say no. In the world of silver, I've recently fallen in love with AK Interactive silver paints. You can see me use them in detail in my last video. I love them because they're super stable on a wet palette, meaning they don't separate very easily. It makes my life a lot simpler because I don't have to get out a special tool to deal with them. Furthermore, they act and paint largely like normal acrylic paint. They stick down like I expect them to. I've always struggled with edge highlighting with silver paint, but these paints largely solve that issue for me. They may be excited to paint in a TMM style, which I feel like is the ultimate litmus test. To highlight this paint, you have to check out Molotow Liquid Chrome. This stuff is absolute magic. It works so well as a bright, glistening final highlight on silver. Typically, it's used as a marker ink, which is why the paint pot is so large and also fairly expensive, but I couldn't recommend it more. You can also just paint with it and apply filters on top of it to get incredible metallic results. Definitely a great paint to have in your arsenal. Speaking of filters, I am absolutely obsessed with Tamiya Clear products. The pots are different sizes because over time I bought every single color in the set. Whenever I give a about a paint job, I always find an excuse to use Tamiya Clear products. Whether you're painting over Molotow Chrome to get a candy red finish, dotting on orange for some gross mushroom juice, painting over clear acrylic for an LED look, glazing into TMM to enliven the metallics, painting drips for pustules, the creative sky's the limit with these paints. To me, they're the ultimate form of what inks should be incredibly saturated and glossy while being very transparent. The red can be blood, the orange can be oil spills. There's just so much you can do with them when you remember to bust them out. They don't handle that well in a brush unthin, so don't plan on doing any large base coats with them. But if you want to thin them for some more delicate brush work, pick up some Tamiya X20A. Lastly, Dirty Down Moss slaps harder than I was slapped as a child. <laughs> Whatever is in this bottle is likely going to kill me, but who cares, the results are so hot. 
you can see me putting it to use in my Kingdom Death video. They also make a Rust and Verdigree product, but I haven't used those so much, so I can't speak to them. And that's it. Those are my favorite paints. If you guys enjoyed this video, you can check out another video where I talk about my favorite airbrush, primer, paintbrush, and other hobby tools. All things linked down in the description below. If you guys like the channel and you want to support it, there are a number of ways that you can do it. Things like support me on Patreon, where you get access to a fun Discord server, where you and I can hang out any day of the week and chat about your miniature painting projects, or what this bit is doing on my desk. The world may never know, unless you join my Discord. You can also buy hobby tools and products that I recommend. All things linked down in the description are affiliate links, so when you buy using those links, I earn some extra dosh at no extra cost to you. You can also buy my model, The Duchess, and a digital course that I made for her, showing you how to paint the box art stroke for stroke. Subscribe or die! But most importantly, don't forget to... I have never made a sound like that before. Hey, my